Ofsted and all, I'd like to revisit with you the evolution of chess style series. So the last time, in the last few installments, we were looking at Nottingham 1936. I was going to check out round seven. And I thought rather than look at all the games of a round, I'd, I'd select key games from a stylistic perspective. And unfortunately, it seemed the draw, there was a draw between Capablanca and Botvinnik, which is a bit dry, which I will perhaps show you in one of the next few videos. Uh, so that's not in 1936. But I think at this point, from a stylistic perspective, we should introduce the rising star, Mikhail Botvinnik, officially. So Mikhail Botvinnik uh, was to become a world champion in the future. Uh, a little bit past Nottingham 1936, after the first Avro, then there was the war, then there was another Avro tournament, which Mikhail Botvinnik won to become world champion. So he's of historically uh, very great importance. And I want to take you back to his first encounter ever with Jose Raul Capablanca in a Simul display in Leningrad 1925. Mikhail Botvinnik was a Soviet and Russian international grandmaster, three times world chess champion, and considered one of the greatest players of all time. He worked as an electrical engineer and computer scientist at the same time. He was one of the very few professional chess players who achieved distinction in other careers whilst playing top competitive uh, chess, according to Wiki. He was actually a pioneer of computer chess, and he was the first world-class player to develop within the Soviet Union. Although Alokhine was a top player before uh, the Russian re Revolution, uh, so Botvinnik was under um, was was able to have considerable influence within Soviet chess, and sometimes he was accused of using that influence to his own advantage. But the evidence was often murky and unclear. So I want to take you back to this simul display, which is interesting actually more interesting than I actually had anticipated. It was on the free day during the Moscow 1925 tournament. Capablanca traveled all the way to Leningrad to give this simul uh, against 30 first category players. And he didn't lose that many that, that day, but uh, let's have a look at this game. So he played white against Mikhail Botvinnik. Botvinnik responded with d5 here, c4, e6 very solid very classical no hyper modern stuff for this game for the moment knight c3 knight f6 bishop g5 and now we see knight bd7 which is quite a popular move instead of bishop e7 Capablanca played e3 also popular as knight f3 bishop b4 now this is a little bit uh, unusual usually c6 is a popular move or bishop e7 but we see bishop b4 which kind of volunteers potentially the dark square bishop. Capablanca played actually c takes d5. Perhaps this is a little bit on the controversial side if it releases this bishop along this diagonal. Uh, knight f3 is usually played here instead. So we see c takes d5. Botvinnik replies e takes d5 naturally. And now again, another unusual idea, perhaps overly ambitious against his skinny 14-year-old uh, opponent. Uh, normally, perhaps a more classical um, on a more classical day, Capablanca will play knight f3 here, and you know White could aim to castle kingside after reinforcing uh, c3 if needed. This this is an example. You'd have this sort of position where White's castles kingside, but in this game we get something altogether very unusual here. Capablanca actually played Queen B3, and he's got an incredibly ambitious idea that after C5, uh, he's going to try and use this weakened D pawn by casting Queen side now. After D takes C5, Queen A5, he doesn't castle Queen side here, but he's about to. Bishop takes F6. Uh, let's just put on a kibitzer here. Uh, if white castles queenside in this particular position, then knight takes c5 is actually very annoying with tempo. So that's, I think that's the reason actually why immediately bishop takes f6 to get this knight away from c5. So knight takes f6, and now this really ambitious castling queenside. 
Now, the astonishing discovery for me is the accuracy Mikhail Botvinnik displays from this point on. I think it's absolutely phenomenal accuracy from black, which is about to be displayed. Now, Castles uh, is, is a, move, a very good move, of course, here. Uh, so it's quite tricky because of this bishop e6 resource just to take on d5 here. If white tries to take on d5, knight takes, and we're running into a skewer, for example. That's not very nice. Or queen takes uh, is, is not much better, I think. Queen takes, bishop e6, and it, it's horrible. So there's all the, you know, this responsibility of casting queenside is already making itself felt uh, that black's just able to do this natural move. And it's good. Knight f3 from Capablanca. And then we see bishop e6, uh, which, which is an accurate move. And you might not think it's a big deal, but the possibility, of course, exists that it's, it's the d pawn blocked here. So does that make the bishop look stupid? Uh, look, look at a bit on, on the dumb side. Or and also this knight d4, if it's going to take, what about this? This f file dynamism is good though. So it's a it's a very very uh, good move. Bishop e6. It threatens immediately d4. And I think every single move actually. I, I just want to note. Tell, tell you explicitly that most of the moves from now on are actually top uh, Houdini 4 choices. This is a top Houdini 4 choice. It's either top or second. This is at depth 20, every single move that Mikhail Botvinnik is about to play. So bishop e6, we see knight d4. It looks entirely logical to stop the d pawn threat. Rook a c8, it does seem entirely logical. I think White's area of responsibility is, is larger because he's castled queenside. He's got to handle this very obvious like pressure that's going to be exerted on c3 pretty soon with his king behind it. Uh, so this variation of castling queenside, I don't think uh, gained in popularity much because you know Black's already standing better here. We see Kappa playing a rather desperate looking move, c6. So he's giving up a pawn just to try and uh, shield his king here a little bit to give his king some warmth. But it's only a little bit. So it's just on the temporary side uh, here. We see bishop takes c3, fracturing white's pawns. Queen takes c3. Now attacking the queen, and we see queen takes a2. So it's a really nasty position already. The area of responsibility shows cracks in, in white's king safety. Uh, diabolical tra uh, cracks, and there's also things like knight e4 potentially on the queen here. We see now, actually, uh, well, with knight e4 as a major threat, bishop d3 perhaps tries to parry that, and also bishop b1 is useful if needed. b takes c6 is played, and now c5. It just seems very, very natural and logical, but you might think, well, knight takes e6. A move like knight takes e6 is, is never that good here. If we just check this out, f takes, black's always uh, got some f file dynamism, and knight g4 hits quite a sensible, rather sensitive f2 square in this position. So that sort of move is, is not great. Uh, Camerblanca tries king c2, which uh, at least you know tries to create a threat of rook a1 potentially. So what can black do about the queen? Well, here actually, uh, queen a4 is quite good, but also, also c5 is very, very good. So in this position, if rook a1, for example, then c takes d4, and we're hitting the white queen. And this is not very nice. This resulting position here is not very nice. We've, we've got this knight g4 move. We've got d4. We've got all sorts of good moves, uh, which give black a big advantage, actually. So. Uh, actually, after c5, we see knight takes e6, and now not f takes e, because actually that would be a disaster, a little bit of a disaster, in that uh, it would almost be equal, but black still the tiny bit better after d4. No, a much more accurate move was played here by Mikhail. Queen a4 check, encouraging uh, b3, if white wants to avoid the exchange of queens immediately. Now queen a2 check, queen b2. Black now just takes the queen off and plays f takes e6. So 
just basically from White Castle and Queenside, it really has just gone persistently downhill. But uh, with this threat of Knight G4, it's now parried with F3 to stop Knight G4. Rook C7 now um, is 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 an interesting move, uh, which helps prepare potential things like Rook B7 or C4 at the right moment. Uh, C4 also was just possible immediately here, but it's also in advance of any attack on A7 with Rook A1. That counterplank is perhaps hoping for a little bit of pressure down the F file. So anyway, Rook C7, we do see Rook A1, and now C4. The timing here with that C3 becoming possible is really dangerous uh, for White. If we just look at this position, uh, what could actually White do though? If he played Rook, you know, C1, then Rook B8 still threatens things like C4. We've got that pin on B3. It's not very pleasant. So let's go with the game continuation. It is Rook A1. And now c4, so a dangerous pass pawn emerging. B takes, d takes, bishop drops back, rook b8 check. It's a very, very pleasant possession for black to play. And you might think, well, from an accuracy point of view, it's as if black's position has been playing itself for quite a while and with tempos all the time. Knight d5 hitting e3 now. Well, he has to react to that. He plays rook e1, and now we see. C3, and this introduces other threats now in the position, such as knight b4, and then possibly later knight takes c2 and rook b2 check. So the c3 pawn is supporting potentially a deadly rook b2 idea at some point. We see now a very um, interesting move rook a3. What can uh, Black do here. Now if, if Bovenik had played rook b2 in this position, he didn't, but white does have potentially an idea like rook takes c3. This has to be factored in, this this little tactic. But even so in this position it's still with favour black after rook takes c3 and rook takes uh, e3. This still favours black, but uh, it's, it's something to bear in mind. And Bovenik actually played even at 14 he played you know what Houdini considers a much stronger knight d4 <laughs> instead keeping the torture going the threat of knight takes c2 and rook b2 check we see rook e2 and here now uh, a very powerful move after this rook e2 is played uh, which is rook d8 it's like that loose piece has automatically been factored in here for this rook d8 actually is more effective because rook d2 will be hitting that loose piece and if ever taking then we then white would lose c2 so this is a highly accurate move rook d8 again it's it's just astonishingly accurate play i know it was a difficult position for white but if you put black's moves under scrutiny since white castle's queenside it's almost faultless play from black e4 and now, uh, to make rook d2 even more effective though, this is a fantastic move, again, a little bit more subtle than you might expect. And actually, seemingly leaving a pawn hanging. Can you guess what black played here? And I'm telling you, this is, this is like the top recommended Houdini 4 move in this position. If I gave you 10 seconds to stop the video, I wonder how many of you would honestly find the next move. So I'll give you 10 seconds. You might want to pause the video. Black to play. What would you play here? Okay, I've given you a subtle clue in earlier analysis about this rook take c3 check, uh, rook c3 trick. You see, rook d2, if rook d2, you know, give yourself minus 50 points because rook takes c3, and it's it's almost, well, black's still better because of this little uh, trick, though. It's almost equal there. Um, but um, black could actually play rook takes e2 in this position and still be better here. But no, what is played 
is really quite ingenious. It's rook c6. It simply defends the rook. It's removing that loose piece out of the equation for rook d2 to be now much more effective without this rook take c3 check, rook c3 uh, trick. The knight is protecting the rook. Rook d2 is more effective. Very accurate play by black. Very impressive, I would say. So now, Capablanca is faced with a huge rook d2 threat. Very, very difficult to parry, impossible to parry. If he takes the pawn, well, again, rook d2 is just really, really strong. He's going to end up losing a bishop here. So, so losing a7 pawn is no big deal. He doesn't bother uh, taking that. He just plays rook e3. And we get this very powerful rook d2 now. And White's a bit helpless here. What does he do? What would he do in this position? If he plays bishop b3, then just rook takes g2 is pretty strong. And now we're threatening rook, check, bishop d1, and c2. This, this pawn's a menace in this position. There's a wall here provided by this knight and the pawn to stop the king moving out. If rook e1 here, then knight d3 check. It's just a total disaster if bishop uh, c2, bishop c2 to b3, but there's nothing else really for white. Capablanca tries, rook a takes c3, and he's just losing a piece. Rook takes c2 check, just winning a piece. And here, Capablanca resigned. Now there's different reports depending on perspective that um, Capablanca said generously from one from one report that um, you know this is a future champ. He'll be a future champ one day. But from Mikhail Botvinnik's own account, apparently he didn't say that, and he just kind of seemed a bit annoyed and put the pieces together and went on to the next board. But um, I I personally was quite astonished by the accuracy from Black displayed uh, when White castled queenside. It was a position uh, kind of untenable, believe it or not. Just the error of responsibility for, for White's king safety um, is virtually untenable, especially the way Black was, was playing. Accurate move after accurate move. Uh, but you could you could argue, well, the position kind of played itself. But I wanted to show you this as a prelude uh, for the more dull game in Nottingham, uh, in the Nottingham tournament encounter, but um, it's important in this style series to really introduce, I think, formally Mikhail Botvinnik, and this was his first like major achievement, beating the world champion in a simultaneous display, Leningrad 1925. In fact, Capablanca was perhaps a bit too exhausted or annoyed by this whole simul. He actually lost four games in total. And he, when he went back to his tournaments that he was playing in, he lost to someone called Volinsky. So, I don't know, the exhaustion of, of, of traveling a lot of uh, miles as well, but uh, maybe this, this loss had something to do with it as well. He wasn't best pleased. Okay, uh, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.